Welcome to Built to Go, a van life podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Wagg, coming to you from the College of Curiosity. This time it's episode 173. We're going to talk about different strategies to stay cool when it's the hottest outside. There are some things you can do, but putting in an air conditioner probably isn't one of them. We're also going to talk about rock wool, the much maligned insulation that can actually work really well for you. We'll be reviewing some folding brackets that can actually work for you as well. And, well, I'm going to talk about why I pronounce things weird. (laughs) Anyway, welcome back. Thank you so much for joining me here. And uh, first off, I have to give a shout out to Rad Loser (laughs) and Dan for making this episode commercial free. Thank you guys very much. There will be no ads in this episode. Sorry for you YouTube folks. That's a different thing. Mm -hmm. And you can support this show if you go to buymeacoffee.com slash built to go. That's two T's, not three, not one. And here's my new deal. For a long time, I've been giving out stickers, and now it's very easy. If you would like a sticker, and here, I've got an example right here. If you would like a hook walk bang sticker that is question mark greater than exclamation point in comic speak, you may get one if you just make a donation at buymeacoffee.com slash built to go. And everybody who's already donated is welcome to have a sticker. Just send me an email at jeff at builttogo.com, and I will send you a sticker. Of course, I'll need your address. So uh, everybody who's already donated can have a sticker, and anybody new will automatically get a sticker as long as you send me your address, okay? And you live in the United States or Canada because mailing these things costs a fortune for some reason. Anyway, uh, we need to talk about something very important. You actually might hear some wind noises around me and that's because i have fans on i've got a fan over here and i've got a fan over here and i think the air conditioning's on and it's because it's hot it's very very hot now i'm actually in one of the cooler parts of the country i'm recording this from my studio in chicago and we're having a relatively mild summer but i know for a lot of the rest of you that is not the case and from what i'm seeing in predictions this is the new norm and you've seen that scary thing that this might be the coolest summer summer you will ever experience for the rest of your life? Hmm. I don't know, but uh, at any rate, I do know it gets really hot in vans. <laughs> I have spent my share of nights in the van being way, way too hot. And well, I'd like to help you overcome that to some extent. And I see a lot of stuff out there that people say works to help cool your van. And I just don't believe it because I've tried a lot of it and it simply doesn't work. So before we get started on this, let me dispense with one thing right away. You probably can't have air conditioning in your van unless you're hooked up to shore power. Now, if you're hooked up to shore power, if you're staying in a campground or you're mooch docking or you just happen to be at a place with an electrical plug, it's not that big of a deal to put air conditioning in your van. You can put in a wall unit or a split unit or and there's a bunch of different ways to do it. It's just a matter of figuring out where to put things. But then you just plug in the air conditioner and you're fine. I'm talking about boondocking with air conditioning. That is a much, much bigger problem. And there are people who have done it, but without question, all of these people who have done this have spent boo dollars to do so. Thousands and thousands of dollars. So if you're gonna build out the kind of rig that has a 70 or $80,000 build on it on top of the cost of the van, yes, you might be able to get air conditioning, but you're always going to have this one problem, and that is, sure, you can have air conditioning for a day, But then how do you charge those batteries again? Because you only have so much space on the roof of your van for solar, and heck, the next day it might be raining. So think about that. Because it's such a hard nut to crack, easier now, things are getting a little simpler. There are some 12 volt roof air conditioning units that are actually fairly affordable for the first time. Uh, I think you should kind of just not consider having air conditioning, unless you're gonna have shore power. And so for the rest of us who aren't going to have air conditioning, well, what can we do? There are what I call the three variables, and those are latitude, altitude, and humiditude. Okay, I I understand I just made up a word here, but it rhymed, so I had to do it because humidity just seems silly. But, But let's talk about these because these are the best way to stay cool in the summer. Uh, Latitude is simply how far north and south you are. If it's hot, generally, go north. (laughs) 
I mean, it seems kind of simple, but I have to say generally because it's not always true. For example, if you're in Arizona, it may actually be cooler in Arizona than if you go up north to someplace that's more humid. Uh, it, it, it's a very complicated thing. So first thing to consider is latitude. North tends to be better. But the next thing you can consider, and sometimes this is a shorter drive, is altitude. Temperature goes up as you go higher. Great example of this is Death Valley. The lowest point in the contiguous United States and the highest point in the contiguous United States aren't that far from each other. They're only a few miles from each other, actually, in Death Valley. It's Mount Whitney and Badwater Basin are, the, are those two. Um, I can tell you something. The temperature difference between those two is a lot. <laughs> And they're not that far away. So altitude can make an enormous difference. And the other thing is humidity. Now, I grew up in the Boston area, very humid part of the country. I live in Illinois, very humid part of the country. And I've, I've lived in many different places that were all pretty humid. But I've also lived in Utah and Nevada. And in my opinion, I am more comfortable if it's 100 degrees out with very low humidity than if it's 85 degrees and high humidity. In, in fact, I know that I am. I mean, it's not even a question. And okay, now someone's going to ask, well, what about swamp coolers? All right, time out. Time out, swamp coolers. If you're from the west, you know what a swamp cooler is. If you're from the east, you probably have no idea what a swamp cooler is. Swamp coolers are basically boxes with a fan in them, and the fan blows over straw or some spongy material or something that absorbs water. And when the fan blows the air over the water, the water evaporates, and whenever water goes through a phase change, changing from a liquid water to gaseous water, which we call steam, <laughs> but you can't see it, uh, it uses up a lot of energy and it makes the surrounding air cooler so you actually end up with cold air blowing out of this thing and and that's called a swamp cooler and they're used all over the southwest but why haven't people from the east heard of them well the answer is that humiditude again humidity well it doesn't allow this process because the air has a certain capacity for holding moisture. And once it's near 100, 100% 100 humidity, it can't hold any moisture and it's actually going to start raining. And with these swamp coolers, if you're dealing with a situation where you're already at 85% humidity, the device simply can't put any more water in the air. So all it does is make things more moist, <laughs> which is definitely not something you want. But in the desert southwest, when you're dealing with 15% humidity and it's 100 degrees out, a swamp cooler could be a great thing. And yes, there are swamp coolers for vans. They work and they use less power. So, you know, they, they have that advantage going for them. You can easily run one on 12 volts, but they use water which is another precious resource. So you actually have to figure out how much water you're going to use. And they require a bit of maintenance because as all this water evaporates, it makes a crust and things can grow in there. Hence the name swamp cooler because they can sometimes smell swampy. And the entire time using this thing, you're pumping your van full of moisture, which uh, you, you may not want to do. So anyway, <laughs> dispense with that. <laughs> Okay, so let's assume you've dealt with the three variables. You've gone north, you've gone up, and you've gone to a place with lower humidity. The way I do this practically is whenever I'm out on the road and I'm planning where I'm going to stay for the night, I look at the weather forecasts. I will look to see where is it going to be below 80 degrees at night because that's kind of my limit. If I can get it down to 80 degrees... I'm pretty much okay. I can do the night. And I've noticed there are things like, you know, it can be a little bit cooler if you just go up a couple hundred feet. And if you're watching the weather very carefully, you can kind of slip in behind a thunderstorm and it will be much cooler there. So you learn these tricks on the road that it doesn't really matter what the temperature is during the day. It's at night that matters because that's when you have to sleep. And you can be strategic about where you go with the three variables and a, a few other little things. Now, Fans are super important. I love fans. I love having a fan blowing on me all the time. I've got two fans blowing on me now, plus the air conditioning. And I've talked about my venti fan a few times now. I love my venti fan. I wish they had an affiliate program. I could be a venti evangelist. But uh, no, I love my venti fan. Fans are great and I think essential. And if you haven't figured out why fans make you feel cool, it's not because they blow cold air. They blow the same temperature air that's around you anyway. What they do is increase the amount of airflow over your skin, and your skin is always covered with a little bit of perspiration 
evaporation. I mean, even if you're not sweating heavily, you've got a little bit of moisture on there, and the fan air actually evaporates that. And then we're back to the phase change principle. Evaporation cools things off, and it cools you off if you have a fan blowing on you. And on the hottest nights, I will have every fan I can blowing on me. I'll have one on my face. I'll have one on my body. I will sleep on top of the sheets or maybe with just the lightest sheet on there. Sometimes I'll put a fan under the sheets if that is practical. That kind of works sometimes. But the idea is to just get as much airflow as possible. Because at 80 degrees, you're not in any danger or anything. You're not going to overheat at 80 degrees. It's all about comfort. And for me, fans are super comfortable. But I know that's not true for everybody. I know some people really don't like the feeling of air blowing on them. That It feels like things crawling on them or whatever. I don't really have a great solution for you other than to increase ventilation as much as possible. Have the fans blow out. Have the fans, like if you have your Max Air fan or your Fantastic fan on the roof, have that blow out and then suck air into the van, which you won't be able to feel necessary, but it'll still move that air enough to cool you down at least a little bit. Another thing to consider is, you know, be in the shade. <laughs> I mean, if you want to keep your van cool, being in the shade is a huge thing. I mean, everybody knows this, but we in the van life community have a special problem with that in that we often have solar panels on the roof of our vans and the shade and the solar panels, they don't get along. So a strategy for this is to bring another set of solar panels that you can put in the sun while your van is in the shade. It's complicated. You've got to bring in more stuff. You've got wires to run and things like that, but that's one way to mitigate it. Or if you have battery to battery charging maybe your battery is going to be full enough that you can go a day without solar but but yeah it's a trade-off shade makes a huge impact in how hot your van gets but the solar recharges your batteries so you got to make a decision there now here's a controversial thing i'm going to say the i word insulation anytime you talk about insulation someone's going to disagree with you which i'm fine with i can only talk from my experience and what i've read and what i understand about this insulation's purpose is to slow down the change of temperature from inside the van to the outside of the van if the van's warm and it's cold outside it will slow down how long it takes for the van to get cold inside and vice versa the problem is, is that on the hottest days, no insulation is going to keep the inside of the van cool. It's always going to catch up. And by six or seven o'clock at night, the temperature inside the van is going to be pretty close to the temperature outside. But then you've got a problem because remember I said insulation slows down the change of temperature. Well, that means that when your van is 85 degrees and it starts to cool off at night, it's going to take a long time for that 85 degrees to turn into 75 degrees. The insulation is actually going to keep the heat in the van. Now there's an argument that you shouldn't insulate your van at all if you're going to use it mostly in hot weather. My idea is that you want to have some insulation. You know, just put some insulation, but don't go crazy. You want to keep that direct sun from heating up your van, so a layer of thinsulate, or as we'll talk about, rock wool, will be just fine. But don't go crazy with the insulation if you're going to use your van in the hottest parts of summer. And definitely, all the ventilation you can get Always. Part of dealing with this hot weather is also strategy. Don't be in your van at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. You know, live out of your van. Stay out of there during the day and just use it for sleeping. So if you're somebody who's a content creator, for example, find a library, find a coffee shop, something like that. Spend the day there. Go to a museum. Go on a hike. Do whatever. But stay out of the van until night and just use it for sleeping. Cook outside. Shower outside. The van will just be for sleeping. You're going to do everything you can to make yourself comfortable then. You're never going to be comfortable in there in the day. If you try to do that, you're going to end in frustration. It's going to be nearly impossible. And then we have to talk about pets. Yeah, pets is super hard. Uh, they make some devices that'll help you monitor temperature and things like that. But even if you have the temperature monitoring device and you somehow have air conditioning in the van, what if a circuit breaker blows? Your van's going to heat up very, very quickly. If you can't be back in that van to get your pets in five or ten minutes, they could be in trouble. So think about that. If you're going to be traveling with pets in your van during really hot weather, you kind of have to have them with you all the time because if you're comfortable, they've got a much better chance of being comfortable.
And finally, someone, uh, believe it or not, it was published in Bloomberg, of all places, uh, has a map of how you can travel the United States and stay at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, which is, what, 21 degrees Celsius, something like that. A temperature that's always comfortable, even if you have to put on a sweater or whatever. You can actually visit the entire 48 contiguous states and stay at that temperature if you follow these maps. We'll have a link to that in the show notes. So, um, folks, don't fall for any of these scams where, for 40 bucks, you can have an air conditioner that'll cool everything. Um, they, they just they just don't work. Some of them will work a little bit. In fact, I'll have another link here. Big Rob's van. Big Rob just did a review of, I think it was the Arctic Breeze. I think it's the one he did, which is this little air conditioner that promises it'll cool the entire planet if you just flip a switch. Yeah, it, it goes about how you'd think, but, but Rob goes into it in a lot of detail. So if you want to see if this thing's really worth your money, watch Rob's video and I'll, I'll have it in the show notes. Tech Talk. I hear a lot of bad talk about rock wool. Now, rock wool is a brand name for mineral wool. This stuff is not wool in that it doesn't come from sheep or any other animal. It comes from, well, mostly slag. It comes from, like, rock residues and just waste rock. And what they do is they heat that rock up until it's molten and then blow air through it. And it makes these fibers that look like wool. Hence the name rock wool or mineral wool. It is not the same as fiberglass. Fiberglass is a completely different material made differently and most importantly has very different properties. I like rock wool. I don't really like fiberglass. Now, a lot of vans, or, or rather, a lot of RVs, commercially built RVs, use fiberglass. You know, the pink stuff that gets little shards in you and feels terrible. It's cheap. It's a common household material, and they probably shouldn't use it. But they do, and they always have, and that's them. We're not them. We're building out our own vans. We can use rock wool. Now, why would we? Well, rock wool's kind of the wonder material for vans, in a way. It has some downsides, but let me give you its pros to start with. First off, it's not very expensive. Second, it's actually completely natural, even though it sounds like, oh, it's, it's technically it's cracked slag, even though that sounds terrible. All it is is molten rock that has had air blown through it. That's it. There's no chemicals in it. I, I know everything's made of chemicals, but hopefully you know what I mean. And it has great properties. It has a great R value. It has excellent sound deadening. And most important, perhaps, is that it is water resistant. So what happens with rock wool is if it gets wet, like let's say there's condensation in your wall or a leak or whatever, it just sits there and waits for itself to dry. And that's it. There's nothing organic in there for mold to grow on or anything like that. So it's wet, it'll get wet, and it just dries out eventually. So that's a really nice feature. Plus, it's easy to form. You can rip it into the sizes you need or cut it into the sizes you need and just put it wherever. It's not rigid at all. So you can cover your whole van with it. Okay, now what are the cons? Well, it isn't exactly like fiberglass, but it is a little bit itchy when you're installing it. You do want to wear long sleeves and gloves. Now, none of those little fibers will escape into your van. As long as you have the stuff covered after it's installed, you're fine. But while you're installing it, yeah, you can get a couple of those little shards. And they're not anywhere near as bad as fiberglass, but that does happen. Another thing is that if it gets compressed, if you squish it down, it loses a lot of its R value. So you want to keep it as fluffy as possible. And I suppose you do have to worry a little bit that mice can make nests in it. Uh, it's, the, it's a material that mice might like to make a nest out of. Now, it does not at all compare to Havelock wool or actual real wool. I don't actually like that stuff. I've talked about that before. I think this is better. But you will see all kinds of stuff on the internet about rock wool's terrible, you should never use it, blah, blah, blah. I don't buy it. I've used rock wool. My NV200 had a lot of rock wool in it. It was completely fine. It's completely safe and manageable. Oh, one other con I just thought of. It can be a little bit tough to attach to the side of your van. Some people put glue and then kind of glue it to the sides. Some people will make these battens and kind of fit it in behind them. So that part can be a little tricky, but heck, you've got that problem with all insulation. So if you're thinking about building out a van or you've got a particularly troublesome spot that you can't figure out the right insulation for, Rock will, will probably work, and you can buy it in bats or rolls, and uh, I think the bats are probably best for van life. 
product review. So I bought these folding shelf brackets. <laughs> Very exciting, but obviously horizontal space is super important in your van. And sometimes you have a situation where if you put in a counter, it's going to get in the way of the door, but you really need a counter there and you also really need the door. So what do you do? And the answer is you put in a folding shelf and they make these brackets that are perfect for this. So it's an L bracket, except that it has a button on it. And when you press the button, the L collapses and the shelf drops and you can go by. And this one that I bought, I've been using for a while now and well, it's pretty good. It's very inexpensive. It's made of stainless steel, so it's fairly tough. And it was really not a big deal to install. I just kind of screwed it into the cabinet, and then I, what I used was a scrap piece of wood. You could use a cutting board or whatever you want to use for your countertop. I screwed that onto the other part, and I just lift it up, and it snaps in place, and boom, I have more horizontal space. Now, they come in pairs, but I only used one of them because I thought, well, first off, it's a fairly small space that I'm doing, but second off, you have to press the button on this to make it collapse, and if there are two of them, you'll have to press both buttons at the same time, and I thought that would kind of be a pain if I was in the middle of cooking or something. So for me, my little countertop folding shelf thing is only about 12 inches long, and one of them has been just fine. It's perfectly strong enough. The only con I have for these is that they rattle a bit. Hasn't been too bad, but they it's not a very secure latching you know it, it's not that the thing's going to fall apart or anything like that it's just that when it's in the up position it it rattles a bit and if you're driving down a bumpy road you'll definitely hear that and if it's in the lower position it doesn't lock in the lower position so it can also rattle a bit there you could fix this with a bungee cord or some little rubber bumper things or whatever but overall for fourteen dollars <laughs> that's seven dollars a piece this is a pretty good solution for all your folding shelf needs and i recommend them i'll have a link in the show notes um, they're on amazon they don't have a brand name i mean the brand name if you look in the little tiny fine print is viba cd v-e-b-a-c-i-d-i -I. I don't know what that is i don't know what most of these are and it's just folding shelf brackets with install screws heavy duty stainless steel oh and if you're curious um they hold 300 pounds <laughs> i'm not going to test that but with 300 pounds i mean technically you could make like a ladder on the outside of your van with these and no i don't think that's a good idea tales from the road Okay, so some of you, Brian, have been on my case for how I pronounce certain words, uh, and I'm going to address that. <laughs> so I grew up in Boston, <laughs> and in Boston, we have an accent, and it's a fairly strong accent, and I grew out of it as I moved out of the area and actually worked at changing the way I speak. I used to say park the car, I used to go to Beverly for lunch, and I've been down to Harvard Yard, and you know, I really did talk like that. In fact, my father, my father, my father actually had it much worse. He would say hoss, <laughs> not for the character from Bonanza, but for any four-legged quadruped that is raced. <laughs> he wouldn't say horse, he'd say hoss. I think he still does that. But uh, anyway, I had this this difference in the way I spoke to everybody else, so I tried to change it. But then I ran into the situation where not everyone pronounces the same words the same way, so I had no way to be correct. And now that I'm on a podcast that's international, I mean, you know, I've got listeners all over the place, and they all pronounce things different, it's impossible for me to pronounce something the way everybody pronounces it, because y'all say it different depending on where you are, okay? So... I'm not going to make apologies for it. However, it has been pointed out that I'm inconsistent in how I pronounce things. And uh, yes, <laughs> yes, I am. I am because my brain will just switch from one to another. So one word that comes up all the time is tour or tour or tur. <laughs> I hope one of those made sense to you. In Massachusetts, at least where I grew up, the word tour, T-O-U-R, rhymed with tor t-o-r-e they sounded the same they were just spelled different so i'm going on a tour i tore my pants exactly the same and i've heard people say that's crazy that's not how you say it but meanwhile in other parts of the country they say tur and that rhymes with fur as in one two three fur 
which is how they say it in Utah, or at least did when I was there. You see the problem. But the word that has gotten most feedback is composting, or should it be composting? <laughs> and what I will do is I will always say compost, but when I'm referring to a toilet, I will say composting toilet. And that just tweaks some people because it's inconsistent. So I did a little bit of research and I found out that, yeah, as you might have expected, in the UK they say composting. But that's not where I got it from. The very first reference I ever had to a composting toilet was in a song by the band Human Sexual Response. <laughs> they have a song called Southern Exposure, or Keep a Southern Exposure, which talks about all these different ways to save energy, and then there's kind of this rap at the end where they say, composting toilets. And I was maybe 13 when I first heard this song, and that stuck in my head is how you say the word. So if you want to compost your waste, you can start with a composting toilet. Caveat. Composting toilets do not compost waste. <laughs> that is a myth. They start the process, they don't finish it. So there you have it. That's why I say things weird. I'm going to continue to say things weird. And if you say I'm saying them wrong, I'm sorry, you're just wrong because it's English. We don't have actual hard rules. We get to say whatever we want. It's not like the French who have this academy that decides this is the proper way to say the word. We don't have that. And, uh, you know, I'm kind of happy about that. A place to visit. I've been this, to this place a few times, uh, and there's a few different places like this, but this place I'm specifically going to refer to is the Hannah Dustin statue that's on an island in Boscawen, New Hampshire. <laughs> I will have a link in the show notes. I'm not even going to begin to try to tell you how to get there, but it's an exit off of I-93, and you go to a parking lot, and you walk through some woods, and anyway. Who's Hannah Dustin? This is a very long story, and I'm not going to tell you anything but the highlights. And it's super, super complex. But basically, in Haverhill, Massachusetts, which is spelled Haverhill, but we say Haverhill, it was a frontier town in the 1600s, and a family lived out there in the woods. And, well, basically an Indian tribe came down from Canada and raided the village, killed all the men, and dragged the women and children off. And Hannah Dustin had an infant, and, well, the infant was slowing them down so uh, they kind of killed it they killed her infant and dragged them off to become slaves and at night they all camped out on an island in the merrimack river and during the night hannah dustin escaped and grabbed a couple of kids and took off down the river that should be the end of the story but it's not at some point in her journey she remembered that there was a good amount of money to make by bringing Indian scalps into the town and turning them in for a bounty. So she went back and she killed all the Indians, men, women, children, scalped them all, and went back to town and collected her bounty. Okay. Is she a hero or is she a villain? Because if we take the side of Hannah Dustin, these people came in and killed her baby and, you know, she scalped them all good for her, you know? But if you take the part of the Indians, well, they were just doing what they were doing to protect their livelihoods because all these white people moved into the land. I mean, it ends up being a super complicated story, and weirdly, it ends up being a story about Catholics versus Protestants, because the Indians were Catholic, having been converted by the French, and Hannah Dustin's family was Protestant, and anyway, this enormous controversial thing. But... Hannah Dustin's family obviously was very much convinced that she was a hero. And even today, they continue to hold her up as an American hero. And they've built statues to her all over the place. There's some in Haverhill. And then there is this one on an island in Buscowin, New Hampshire. Now, this is a very tall statue. It's on a pedestal. And she's probably 10 or 12 feet tall on the statue. And... In her hand, she's holding a bouquet of roses, you know, which isn't that unusual. And she's in a long dress. Imagine a pioneer woman statue, and you've pretty much got the idea of what this thing looks like. But the roses are a little weird, because they're kind of wilted, and they're upside down. And, um, well, it's because they're not roses. They're, they're actually the scalps of the Indians. 
and they took the time to sculpt this <laughs> as part of her statue. And some of the locals who know the story will go there and paint the scalps red to help remind people that this is a very complex story. But uh, anyway, this is a place you can go and something you can see for yourself. It's off of an exit on I-93 in Buscawa, New Hampshire. There's a trail out of the parking lot near the exit and you end up on this island in the Merrimack River that no, isn't even the right island, but it's there and you know, heck, <laughs> you can see it. <laughs> resource recommendation so i know a lot of people love the idea of having a four by four camper and they can go anywhere and camp anywhere and i've said this before i'm going to say it again doesn't matter how four by four your van is it's still a van and uh, there's a great example of this matt's off-road recovery who i've talked about before very popular channel but they recently recovered a very nicely built out four by four sprinter van on the honeymoon trail in southern utah and uh, that vehicle had no business being there Sure, if you have a four-wheel drive van, you can go places that a two-wheel drive van can't. I'm not going to argue that at all. But don't compare your rock-crawling Jeep to a 4x4 camper van. They're different vehicles with different capabilities. You probably can't take a shower in your Jeep, but neither can you climb the gnarliest trails in your 4x4 camper van. And if you want to see what I'm talking about, watch this video that I have linked in the show notes. You can just search for Matt's Off-Road Recovery Honeymoon Trail Sprinter Van and you'll find it. But uh, yeah, it was pretty amazing. First off, kudos to the driver. First time out on the trail for getting as far as he did. But uh, yeah, he needed their help to get out. <laughs> So just remember, we're still in a camper van here. And yeah, 4x4 is great. And you can have winches and lockers and all this stuff. But you're still dealing with a big, heavy, wide box. And that's going to put you at a disadvantage to start with. So know your limits, but uh, you know, go ahead and push them from time to time. Little bit of an announcement. This Thursday, let's see, this Thursday, July 20th at 5 p.m. Central Time, I'm going to do a live AMA, ask me anything kind of a thing. I'm going to be talking about the Panama Canal cruise, an upcoming Antarctica trip, uh, a trip next year to Salem, Massachusetts. That would be excellent for van life, folks. And folks, you can ask me anything you want. I'm going to sit there in front of my computer for two hours. So there's a link in the channel. I'll put a link in the show notes, but it's Thursday, July 20th, 2023 at 5 p.m. And I'm going to give it a shot. I've never done this before. I don't know what's going to happen. I might be staring at this little green light on my computer for two hours. And if that's the case, that's fine. I'll just like, you know, have a beer and stare at myself, <laughs> which I do an awful lot of these days. So thank you very much for listening to this episode 173. Music, as always, is by Simon Wagg. If you'd like to get a hold of me, I mean, we've got a Facebook group, we've got a Discord channel, and you can always send me an email at jeff at builttogo.com. That's two T's, not three, not one. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Until next time, remember the words of scientist Alan Kay, who said, context is worth 80 IQ points.